Hello, everybody. My name is Jimmy Smith, and welcome to the Wine with Jimmy channel. This is an educational channel to help you with your WSET exams and further afield. Now, we are looking here at the WSET level three, and this is going to be focusing on the wine region, the Napa Valley, part of California. This will also include a working written question at the end, which I will work through with you so you can gain very good confidence and understanding when it comes to answering the all important short written answer questions. If you do have any comments or questions or concerns, you can get in touch with me here at Wine With Jimmy by the social media that you see at the bottom of every slide or by the comment section below this video on YouTube. Please make sure you click subscribe or by the website www.winewithjimmy.com. Let's begin looking at the Napa Valley, a very important wine region uh, situated, of course, in California. Here you've got the Napa Valley wine train, which cuts through the middle um, of, the, uh, of the AVA of Napa Valley. Napa is the name of um, the valley, which so therefore there is a river running through it. And there's also Napa City, which is situated towards the southern section of the, the river and the valley as it heads towards the San Pablo Bay, uh, just so you have your information. But before we move on with that, just looking at the wine regions of the United States of America. Now, the United States of America everywhere produces wine in some way, shape or form. And that is because there is a lot of um, local varieties uh, that are situated in the US, uh, along with hybridized varieties, plus then Vitis vinifera, the European type species, which has been, of course, planted over here. So there are some places such as uh, Montana, Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, where it's very cold um, throughout most of the season. But there are some varieties dotted around here, but they're more uh, non Vitis vinifera. And the same in the very sort of warm and humid places like Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi. Um, the same will uh, apply to that as well, more kind of hybridized or local non vitis vinifera. But we are looking at uh, those four states really on this screen. So on the eastern seaboard, that's New York state, and that's covered in another video looking at the Finger Lakes. If you want to click and find the Finger Lakes to learn about things like Riesling and the lake effect. Uh, Washington, so Washington state with Seattle as its capital with the great Cascade Mountain running through it is important certainly for Columbia Valley and Yakima Valley. And then Oregon with the Willamette Valley, beautiful landscape situated on the, um, the western side of the Cascade Mountains, south of Portland, Oregon, making some of the world's most beautiful Pinot Noirs plus Chardonnay. But we are actually looking down here at California, which produces about 92, 93% of uh, the United States' Vitis vinifera production. So it's a very large production, mainly around San Francisco to Los Angeles. Um, big, big production here, lots of wonderful history as well, and some of the world's most finest wines, and also some of the world's most bulk wines comes from this large region, the biggest by far in the United States. Um, so one thing we need to look, there is the <coughs> California on the map. We've just highlighted the state of California, and you'll see that We've got quite a bit to talk about here. Um, and I will mention the fogs in a second, but you'll see this kind of purpley patch down here, which is north of San Francisco, around San Francisco, and then down towards Los Angeles. This is really where we find the bulk of our vineyards. Uh, and that's where we call the coastal ranges. I'm gonna draw that in for you so you can understand exactly where that is. So this is all of this kind of area down here. So there are coastal ranges here where we'll find a number of vineyards. Now, on the other side of the state, on the far eastern side, you'll see along this area, this is actually what we call the Sierra Nevada, which separates it from Nevada, uh, which is beyond it to the east. This is a very large mountain range um, forming that natural border. But you'll see then what we have, because we have um, the Sierra Nevada, uh, and then we have the coastal ranges, we have 
a depression in the middle, which I will identify for you in light green. So this area here is a depression. That is what we call the central valley. And the central valley accounts for around 80% of the total production of California. So it's very significant in terms of bulk production, certainly in areas like Sacramento Valley, which is uh, up here, and then areas like the San Joaquin Valley as well towards the southern section. So big productions here of very generic wine. But we will be focusing purely on the coastal zones because that's where the premium wine can be found, the, the very sort of famous wines of the region. You'll see here that uh, we have also identified, I'm gonna get rid of those marks I've made, We've identified that there is a cold weather pattern moving in from the Pacific, which means uh, meets a very warm or hot weather pattern, which is built up in the Central Valley and those locations. Now, the cold Californian current provides the cold air, and this is often accompanied by marine fogs, and they are drawn in from the ocean, uh, and this is in the evening, and of course, this will lower nighttime temperatures. In addition, the time it takes for the sun in the morning to actually burn through the fogs is actually quite long because these fogs are fairly thick in the morning. And often by about 9.30 or even 10 o'clock in the morning, that's finally when the fogs are diminished by the sun the next morning. So this means that the cooling influence not only happens at night time, due to the fact that this is being drawn in, but also in the mornings as well. So you'll find that you have that um, cooling effect in the mornings, which is absolutely priceless for the vineyards. Uh, it can actually be sometimes so dramatic uh, that the cooling influence on the grapes, certainly by the coastal zones, really close to the coast, uh, really affected the most. And grapes can actually struggle to ripen in these very coastal zones, which is absolutely crazy. Um, but generally speaking, we are talking about this fog effect that comes in. So areas that are located close to the sea, which is the Pacific Ocean, will experience marine fogs. This may be in areas like the Petaluma Gap in Sonoma, Sonoma County, <clears throat> places like Monterey, Mendocino County. But of course, what we're looking at today of Napa Valley, of course. Now, I just want to show you a nice little video, which gives you an idea of what these fogs will look like. So let me just go to the video. Here we go. There we are. So this is a, what a drone has taken across Napa. And I believe this is in the northern extremities of Napa. So this is kind of um, Spring Mountain, Calistoga, that kind of area. And as you'll see, this is a morning fog. Now, the sun is quite bright at this time, so that will be actually dissipating and diminishing that fog. But it is important to notice that the fog still hang around up to a certain level. And this is what we call the fog line. So at about 1,400 metres, sorry, 1,400 feet, uh, the fog line goes up and then it's too cold at that area for any of the fog to condense. So it doesn't actually form above that line. So in the areas which are what we call the bench, so the Napa bench, which are the valley floor. So, you know, only just above sea level up to about 200, 250 meters actually. But beyond and up that to 1400 feet, you will actually find that we have this fog line being created. And it's absolutely pivotal in refreshing the grapes and creating um, good acidities across many of the varieties at lower altitudes. Now, you may notice, as you can see, that there's a line where the, the fog doesn't go above because it gets too cold. But at these high, high altitudes, of course, it's cooler. So they're going to have natural acidities from high altitude. And then the lower altitudes have great natural acidities due to the fogs. Uh, and this is really important in an area that has such robust sunshine and dry conditions, you get wonderful concentrations of fruit, but it is balanced by wonderful acidities, acidities uh, across all of the, um, the locations that we're going to be talking about, but specifically Napa on this section.
So there is Napa Valley, um, Napa County, which is actually in the outline here. Uh, and this lies within the sort of central part of California, uh, just to the north of San Francisco. Sonoma is directly north of San Francisco, which is actually just to the left of this picture. But then there's Napa. OK, so there is the Napa region, as you can see. Now, Napa Valley runs north to south for about 50 kilometers, so fairly long in its direction north to south. But east to west, it is only really about five or six kilometers wide at its most distance point. Um, now, it has some of the most expensive vineyard land in the whole of the United States, and it holds some of the most prestigious wines, certainly when you look at the very top end wines be it Opus One, Screaming Eagle, or Mondavi, and alike. So some very top-end wines found in this area. Now, the climatic zone near here is that it is mostly Mediterranean, but there are a diversity of climatic types across Napa due to its differing elevations of altitude and also its differing effects from things like the San Pablo Bay, which you see at the bottom. Um, the long growing season is marked often by warm summer days and those cool evenings as affected by either altitude or the fogs. And it's ideal for wine grapes to, to ripen nice and gently and with good balance between ripeness and sugar and acidity, as I mentioned earlier. Now, the lack of summer rainfall helps to contribute to very consistent vintages and also there is a reduced uh, risk of disease pressure. Pressures such as fungal and rot molds are very low. So there's a lot of vintage to vintage consistency in the this area. OK, so um, <clears throat> we talked uh, a little bit here about um, about the, the location. Now, I just want to give you a little heads up on that arrow, which is sneaking in at the bottom of the map. And that is what we call the San Pablo Bay effect. So just below this uh, map is the San Pablo Bay. And if you head out from the San Pablo Bay towards the Pacific, you'll eventually go underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, which connects San Francisco to Sausalito uh, and is that very famous architectural wonder. Now, if you then go the other way, so from the Pacific and then inland into the San Pablo Bay, this of course is bringing in the cold Californian current and then those fogs, which will make their way either up here, and I'll just do a little arrow for you so you can see where that is. So some of it will come up here into Sonoma and some will go this way across the Delta towards Lodi and Woodbridge. But we're talking about the arrow here because some of it is drawn up the, the Napa Valley as it goes up the Napa River past Napa City, which is just here, and then comes up here. OK, so those areas which are situated in Napa Valley towards the southern section, and you can see them here, Los Coneros, for instance, uh, will be the most affected by the cooling effect of this wind. OK, and, and that's important to talk about. Let's have a look at uh, this. So here is the valley again with some temperature variation in summer. And I've identified here the two topographical effects on the Napa Valley, which is the Mayakamas mountain range and the Vaca mountain range. So the Mayakamas is situated on the westerly side and the Vaca is situated on the easterly side. And then the river is what runs through the middle of this. OK, so therefore you have altitude on either side and then you have the valley floor in the middle. Now, situated at the bottom here, and I'm going to point this out in green, it says Los Caneros. And you'll see that that is just here. OK, so this is the southerly most AVA. Now, that's one thing I also want to quickly mention, because this is the first thing that you'll see in your text about California. And that is a. V A. So American viticultural area. OK, now the whole of this um, this map is Napa. So all of these wine regions are classified as Napa Valley AVA, which is a very common way of labeling it because it's a very powerful brand. Um, so even if you have some fruit in just, say, Rutherford or some fruit in just Los Caneros, 
you can still put Napa Valley AVA on the label because of its power and its and its labeling. But if you are very specific and you're in just Los Caneros, then you can list with just the um, what's called a nested AVA. A nested AVA is a smaller AVA within the larger AVA. And at the bottom there, you'll see Los Carneros AVA. The most southerly, as I mentioned. Um, so this is um, extends a little bit into um, Sonoma as well, Los Carneros. So you'll see it going into Sonoma. So it's actually a um, inter-regional AVA, um, but this is the coldest. And you'll see that I've given you some average temperatures here. The temperature of um, the red number here is what it gets up to normally in uh, summer, 25 degrees Celsius, which is actually something which is quite similar, for instance, to uh, London here in the United Kingdom or something like San Francisco itself, the city uh, just on the southern side of the Golden Gate Bridge. So 25 degrees Celsius. Then if you have a look up here, I've identified, I'm gonna do this in red and I'll point it out for you. I've identified another temperature here, 35 degrees C in the middle of the bench. It's 10 degrees C more warmer on average when you go into the middle of the valley. Uh, and then as you head towards the northern sections, Calistoga, for instance, it's 29 degrees. So it drops a little bit more, mainly due to altitude, plus the, uh, the Chalk Hill Gap that comes through here as well. A bit of a cold effect there. But we're looking, first of all, here at Los Caneros, much cooler. So these cooler conditions mean that the varieties that we have to play with are not typically varieties that need lots of warmth. And this in Los Caneros, we will find Pinot Noir, and we will find, of course, Chardonnay here as well. Those two always go hand in hand together. So some good Pinot Noir and Chardonnay find, found in Los Caneros and sparkling wine. This is where we find um, Tattinger from Champagne. We have their uh, Domain Carneros. Okay, so <clears throat> that is your most southerly AVA, Los Caneros, and the coolest. Now, you'll see here that we've identified a grouping of three, Stags Leap District, Oakville, and Rutherford. So there is Rutherford, uh, there is Oakville, and there is Stags Leap District. So these are mainly in the middle part of what we call the, um, the Napa Bench. Okay, so this is north along the valley floor, and the climate, remember, increases, and it's 10 degrees C more warmer than Los Caneros right in the southern section. This means it's actually very much perfect conditions for Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, specifically in places, the very famous areas like Stag Leap District. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, so that is that is the uh, the middle zones there. Um, Rutherford has the least effect from the San Pablo Bay, uh, and it's the warmest during the day. And its red wines are considered to have some of the most power and structure of the whole of Napa. So as well as Cabernet Sauvignon, which is the prime contender here, there's also Merlot grown here and even white varieties like Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc. But let's just scribble that down so you have that information. Cabernet Sauvignon mainly, but then some Merlot. Uh, and then things like Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc, which I'm going to put C and S, B there, Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc in those zones. OK, so that's the middle area. Then in the northern section, we have St. Helena and Calistoga. There's Calistoga and there is St. Helena just uh, below that. So these are some of the areas to receive the most warmest daytime temperatures in the Napa Valley and can produce some of the most concentrated and most full-bodied wines. Cool air from the Chalk Hill Gap, which is up here in the north, uh, this actually provides some relief from the oppressive afternoon temperatures and much cooler nighttime temperatures are witnessed here as well. And that helps retain good acidities in the grape. So of course, Cabernet Sauvignon is king here as it is in most of Napa. So let's just pop that down. So Cabernet Sauvignon mainly. And then we also have a bit of Zinfandel. Sorry. 
and Syrah is also found here as well. Um, but I am really going to stress here that Cabernet Sauvignon is the major variety. It does account for nearly 50% of Napa Valley's total production, so it's by far the most important of the lot. Now, all of that is actually what we would find on the valley floor. So from Los Caneros up to Calistoga, it really is around the Napa River. But many of the vineyards are on the valley sides of both the Vaca and the Mayacamus mountain range. Uh, and some of them will lie above the fog line and they are cooled by their altitude. Uh, but aspect will also play a vital role here as well. So uh, you will see this area. Um, let me just get my arrow ready for you. You'll see Howell Mountain just there. And the direction of this is generally sort of southwest. So these west and southwest facing vineyards get full exposure of sunlight, certainly with the quite oppressive afternoon sun. And this gives wines that are generally fuller and higher in alcohol. But because this is altitude, the wines are marked by very bright, fresh acidity as well. And then over here, you have Mount Vidir as well. And these are east facing. So these will tend to be lighter and fresher in style with, again, marked acidities due to their altitude. Now, these are the only two that are highlighted in the level three text. But other ones like um, Spring Mountain, uh, things like Diamond Mountain District and Atlas Peak will also be all higher altitude sites, which will experience higher acidities from above the fog line, higher altitude effects. The key grape variety, of course, is Cabernet Sauvignon. Now, prime sites, like I mentioned in places like Stag's Leap, Calistoga, and so on, will produce extremely expressive wines that can rival the best of anywhere in the world. Many of the wines are very full-bodied, are very concentrated with things like ripe cassis flavors with prominent spicy notes from new oak maturation but there will also be some lightly more sort of black currenty style certainly from the higher altitude sites as well now just a um a, a valley a, a video on napa valley here so i just want to show you this because i think this is a, a nice little thing to have a look at so just bear with me a second as i get it rocking and rolling for you um let's go through this here we are good so just a nice little google earth video that really brings it to life so you can see how all of this looks in a 3d mode so let's have a little view there is north america there we are now focusing on california you'll clearly see the central valley there which has on its east the sierra nevada and then the coastal ranges on the west there is San Francisco with the San Pablo Bay. Sausalito is just above it. And we're probably gonna have a look at the famous Golden Gate Bridge, which connects San Francisco to Sausalito. There it is. So of course you get the cold Californian current just beyond to the left there, bringing in that cooler air and lots of marine fogs, which then ride their way up the San Pablo. And for us, in terms of what we've just learned, towards Los Caneros and then the bench of Napa Valley. So that is in fact up here as we head up towards this area and the American Canyon. So here you are, there's Napa City just been identified and here is Napa Valley with St. Helena towards the northern end with Calistoga right at the top there. And now we're looking at the what we call the Napa Bench. There is Napa City just below us and here is the bench. And we're going to have a look at that flat area, Oak Knoll. It's not a part you need to know, but places like Rutherford and Oakville. There is Rutherford that has a wonderful grill called the Rutherford Grill. You'll see um, very, very flat here. This is just, just above sea level. Um, this is where we get big power and concentration from the Cabernet Sauvignons. But those fogs are very important in bringing in those cold nights and then cold mornings, which produce very good acidities. Now we go up into the mountainous area. This is the Howell Mountain AVA, which has high altitude, but aspect, which is actually facing west and southwest. 
In this area, we'll get very good powerful concentrated wines, but very good natural high acidities, which come from the high altitudes. Generally speaking, these high altitude zones across places like Spring Mountain, Diamond Mountain, Atlas Peak, Howe Mountain will generally be not as concentrated as the bench area, but will produce um, slightly more aromatic, fresher uh, and elegant Cabernet Sauvignon dominant wines. Uh, they can be absolutely wonderful and dare I say it, potentially more like a European palette, potentially. So here you'll see um, a short written answer question, which is the all important part of your level three examination. This is where you'll need to focus on the most as it is the most challenging part across the world for students. Name two AVAs, American Viticultural Areas, within the Napa Valley. So this is nested AVAs within Napa that are known for producing premium quality wine. So you can have two of any of these because these are the ones that are listed and highlighted in your level three text. Howe Mountain, Calistoga, St. Helena, which are um, along with places like Mount Verdeer, much more higher altitude zones. And then Rutherford, Oakville, St Stag's Leap, and then Los Caneros. OK, they are your AVAs, which are highlighted in your textbooks. Name three climatic and or geographical factors that can craft premium wines in Napa Valley and explain why these factors are suitable for producing premium wines. Now, we've just gone through those. So let's go through them again. So first of all, factor one would be what we call the San Pablo Bay or the San Francisco Bay cool afternoon breezes. So the proximity to this bay and therefore the Pacific Ocean contributes colder winds that can reduce the temperatures leading to more balance in the grapes. So remember on the map I showed you 25 degrees C in comparison to 35 degrees C from Los Caneros to Rutherford. Los Caneros AVA in the southern part of Napa is around 10 degrees cooler. There you are than the central Napa Valley, for example. That will get you the nice amount of marks just there. Name uh, three climatic, so this is part two, factor two rather, morning fogs from often actually more like 5.30 up to about 10 a.m., but uh, it says six till nine there, which is perfectly fine as well. These will moderate the temperatures of the entire Napa Valley on the bench up to around 1,400 feet in altitude. This will refresh the vineyards after the hot day before, leading to higher natural acidities in the grapes. Okay, cool. So, so far, the cooling effect and then those marine fogs that come in from the San Pablo too. And um, one factor here is also the heat. Now, I mentioned this in terms of temperature around places like Rutherford, but let's just put it into better speak here for you. Factor three then, heat trap via the mountains. The Maya Camus in the west and then the Vaca mountains in the east cause a heat trap effect, especially in the central part. So Rutherford and Oakville causing greater ripeness and what we would say is more powerful and structured wines as a result. OK, so all of that will be enough to state the specific factor and then describe it a bit. Now, there are nine marks here split into three factors. So three factors, that's three marks and descriptions of each of those threes for additional two marks each. But there are other things here as well that you could mention. So I've added in another one here, the altitude. Uh, so in the Maya Camus and the Vaca mountain ranges, there are the source of higher altitude fruit, which creates cooler growing conditions and longer growing seasons that contribute to greater acidities and actually greater tannins. But the wines seem to be a little bit more fresher. This is in areas like Howe Mountain, which is certainly more complex than Mount Vadir in general, but both of them are altitude zones. OK, so that brings me to the conclusion of the Napa Valley for the WSET Level 3. If you do have any comments, questions or concerns, you can get in touch with me here at Wine with Jimmy. You can do so via the social media you find at the bottom of every slide or uh, by commenting on this video below 
or direct at info at winewithjimmy.com. That's the e-learning portal where you'll find all of the help and needs that you can find for your WSET certificates. So thank you so much. If you do find yourself in London, please come and see me for a class, a glass or a bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Thank you so much.